And who of you is like more deaf? And who of you is purely ops? Ah, okay. So, because it's always uh, pretty interesting who's like uh, filling in the issues and asking questions uh, on the SPT native package or mailing list and Stack Overflow, and, and who's actually using it and needs to use it. So, um, about myself, I'm a software engineer at gutefrage.net. I love programming Java and Scala. Um, I'm a happy Eclipse user, thanks to all the guys who are contributing to the Scala Eclipse IDE, and you can find me on Twitter or GitHub. So, now about Java and Scala and the promise, uh, write once, run anywhere. Um, that's, we experience this every day, like if you have a Windows, you can run your Java programs, if you have Mac or Linux, but what about like deploying it anywhere? This is a complete different beast because running on your local machine where you have set up everything correctly and starting it is uh, not that hard, but bringing it to another machine where you possibly don't have uh, that much control uh, about which format is supported and which format uh, is expected, um, it's uh, completely different. So, SPT native packager, what do we mean by anywhere? This is like, well, yeah, a flexible um, uh, name. Um, so, we support um, all the Ubuntu and Debian derivatives, so you can build uh, dev packages to install. Uh, we support RPM, Fedora, and CentOS, so you can build RPM packages. Um, and we also support, surprisingly, uh, very good, um, MSI, so you can install, actually create uh, Windows installers. Um, you can also create uh, DMG, DMG packages for Mac, and in a, since uh, our recent version also like app um, packages, and you can create Docker images, which you can uh, simply run as Docker images. So this is actually what anywhere is defined for SPT native packager at the current stage. Um, I want to talk about uh, like the goals and this project has because sometimes uh, people are uh, confuse us with like we are an RPM build tool support. Uh, that's not one of our goals. Our first goal is to build on the native platform. This sounds maybe not straightforward at the, in the first moment, but we want like a robust build you can easily reproduce on your build machine. So if you want to build a Debian package, it should always build on a Debian system where you need to run it. And actually the SPT native packager has a pretty simple um, way of doing things. It just takes like your package you want to package, builds a, like a build space, creates the necessary like configuration for the um, build tool you're using and then executes the command line tool. So if anything fails, you can like easily reproduce it like um, sending the CLI command on your uh, local CLI as well and in this um, build space directory, so you can like, it's easier to debug if something fails, was it SPT native packager or was it your build tool, is it some configuration on your system? So we, in the first place we want native, um, we support the native platforms. If it's possible like to support um, cross-platform builds, then it's awesome and we do it. Um, if it's too hard, we don't, don't do it because as you uh, saw, we support a lot of platforms and like, maintaining a library that's doing like all the stuff on its own is, is too much for an open source library with uh, that like little community. So the second goal uh, is we want to provide archetypes because setting up builds is not really a, like a fun thing to do. You just want to set it up and it should run and don't do anything else. And this is what the archetypes types are for. So they do everything for you so you don't have to care. And the other um, goal we have is we want to enforce best practices because creating packages is one thing but getting them to run on your target system is a completely other thing. So if you like um, enforce conventions like um, directory structures or permissions on your target system, these best practices, then the likelihood that your package will work on your target system uh, gets really increased. So we are always happy uh, when some external guy say, hey, you're doing this not really the right way. Uh, you should do it like this because it's more back practice. We had it at, uh, with our ETC default configuration. Uh, we changed it actually so it like can be sourced, um, so it can be used um, to configure like environment variables. So um, before I dive into the live demo, I just want to show how easy it should be um, to use SPT native packager. 
First, you add the plugin. Uh, we recently released version uh, 1.0, and with 1.0, we support auto plugins, which is an amazing feature of SBT. And this feature, actually, if you don't know it, it um, wires up every setting you have in your build. You can, an auto plugin can uh, require another auto plugin to load before, and so you have like a dependency graph of plugins, and these settings like get applied in the correct order. So your build SPT just looks like this. Enable plugins, and in this case, uh, I'm enabling the Java app, pack, Java app packaging, which is an archetype which sets up like the build for you, so you have uh, like a predefined uh, default package which uh, contains everything you need to run your application. And then these uh, other two lines, they are not um, mandatory for every package format, but it's kind of courtesy for a lot of people if you specify a maintainer and a small package summary what your package actually does. So I highly recommend it because some build tools work with them, but if you install the package, then they are, mm, there's no maintainer, you can't really deinstall it. So these two lines uh, don't hurt, and I think everybody uh, agrees that they are really readable and don't cl clutter your code. So um, as I want to go a bit more deeper into SPT Native Packager, how it works, um, I just want to introduce you to the two main core concepts of SPT Native Packager, which are actually pretty simple. The first core concept are the mappings. Um, you want to create an output package of some kind of format. So how do you do it? You have, okay, I have these mappings. I have a file in my um, build, and I want to put it in my output target. So this is like the function, uh, the tuple file uh, to string. And in the end, every plugin uses these mappings to create like, okay, I take this file from the build, and then I put it in my build um, space where I, in the end, create the package. So um, these strings are like a relative or absolute path in your output system in the end. And this is basically like, mo uh, like all plugins in SPT native package work. So if you want to like manage these mappings, if you want to add something to a package, you have two options. The first option is like your build SPT. You have those mappings uh, set setting and it's scoped. So this uh, kind of scope, if you're not used to it, like SPT heads, you can have these scope configurations. We can say, okay, mappings in universal has this value. And we heavily rely on, on scopes. So the universal scope is, okay, these, what, what is in this mapping should be available in every package. So you can scope things to Debian, to RPM, to Windows, to Docker, or to universal, so everything gets it. And it's pretty straightforward with the um, new uh, SPT, I think it's 0.13.4 version where you can use .value. It's actually pretty simple. So you take your base directory, map the license file, and say, okay, it should be in the root folder of the target uh, system license. Um, you can also rename files. So the second example, you have like your reference conf, and in your output package, you want to call it application conf, for example. Uh, we also provide some uh, helpers for you. You see the import. Uh, if you want to use them, then you can do stuff like content of this directory or the complete directory, etc. So just to give you some convenience set. Um, so and the other option, option is by convention. So you can put uh, under source universal if you want the static file uh, in every package available. Uh, you can also scope it to, I think, Linux, uh, Windows, and Mac OS X. So you can put like static readme files or license files or how to install this. Uh, which normally don't change or depend on anything on your build. Uh, you can put them in the folder there, and uh, SPT Native Packager will pick them up. And the second core concept, I already mentioned it, are the archetype auto plugins. So this is really for you, so you don't have to care. Um, we actually, we're, we're really happy if we don't ha hear anything from you, because that means that it just works for you. And all the other like packaging plugins, like the Debian plugin or Docker plugin, they really do no setup at all. Uh, only a bare minimum, for example, Docker does like it choose a sensible default for a Docker base image, it chooses Java latest, and, but besides that it does nothing. So if you just enable like Docker plugin, your package output will be empty because nothing is configured. You can do, if you want, everything on your own. And for this, we have like the archetype plugins, which add additional functionality for, for you. We have like the Java app packaging, which is like the most basic um, packaging type. Then you, we have a server archetype, which I will show you in the demo as well. And then you can like 
add special configurations. We have like a class path jar plugin, which like creates a class path jar if you have problems on Windows with too large class passes, and a launcher plugin which starts uh, your jar in a bit different way. So you add like additional flavors of your package output via these archetype plugins. And so that's about uh, all I have to say for the beginning. And now I do want to do some live coding and show you because it's always easy to say, well, it's easy. Um, but showing you how like the workflow with SPT native packager is better to do it live. So, um, so you don't get confused. I first, I just want to introduce like the small setup. So I've um, two tabs here. This is my cheat sheet tab. If I forget uh, some of the, the um, commands I want to set and this is like, I, I choose a, a small activator. Um, it's called the um, Akka HTTP microservices. It just does a little look up um, on, on Google and where the, like, the IP address is. So this is the window uh, where you can see if the service is running or not. And then I, I switch the desktop. You see this? There are the configuration files. So if, when I change something in configuration, I will switch there. And then I go back and we can uh, take a look at the, uh, the result. And I have my console. So this is my, um, can you read, everybody can read it perfectly or should I make it bigger? It's fine? Awesome. Okay, so I have, I have two windows here. Uh, the first is my SPT console and my second one is if I start some of the bash scripts. Okay, so take a look at the build SPT. Uh, only the first line is important because that's the uh, SPT native package part. The rest is normal SPT like name organizations, Scala version, driver dependencies, etc. Nothing special here. And so this is only one line of configuration. And the first thing you, um, you can do with the SPT native packager is um, the stage command. The stage command, it prepares like um, the, the build space, how it would look like in the end. So if we take a look um, at target uh, universal and stage, You see the target output directory contains a binary folder, uh, which has two scripts, a simple bash script, which starts uh, the application, a bat script if you're running on Windows, and then it packages every library dependencies in a lib folder. And with your, of course, with your jar you're building in your application. And that's everything. And we can actually run this pretty easy. So we say um, target universal stage binary and the Arca HTTP microservice. And it will start up the Akka HTTP microservice as you expect. And if we reload our page, um, then we can look at the log outputs. We see, yeah, he's attempting to connecting. And if the VLAN is working uh, smoothly, then we will get like a small JSON output. Um, or in turn, yeah, that's the output. So it looks like uh, it looks for the IP address 888, the famous uh, Google DNS, and says, oh, it's located in Mountain View. So this is actually everything that the service does. Okay, so we, we kill this um, because we want to do something more because we don't like port 9000. This is a very, maybe not this is a common issue, but it's a common um, problem that you want to configure your um, application in different stages of your development. So the easiest thing would be we can start our service with like a um, property. This is HTTP port. I could say, okay, I want to start it on port 88. Then it will run on port 88, as you can see. Um, I can switch. So this won't, won't work anymore. And I can run on port 88. So the service will try to connect and show me the stuff. So this is nice if you have control uh, where you start it. But if you don't, um, well, uh, yeah, you don't. So we want to configure this. So first. Uh, by the way, Grohl Next, uh, Grohl is a great plugin if you want to do live coding. Uh, it's like you can skip through your Git history step by step and prepare everything. So we changed um, the build SPT. I, I didn't change the build SPT. I created a, a packaging SPT where everything is stored in. So you can maybe, uh, maybe you know the Java options. You can specify in SPT how your program should be run with which Java options. And we use this setting and scope it to universal. And we say, okay, I want to use uh, this uh, system property. I want to use it for my universal package. So when I start it, this uh, uh, property should be appended. So 
Let's stage it again. And then we'll take a look at what the output is like. You see uh, a new folder uh, got generated, uh, conf, with an application ini. This application ini, it formerly in the last, in the 0 0.8 um, SPT native packager, it was, we, well, misused the etc default for this. But now we call it application ini because it has a very, like, similar format to the eclipse ini uh, file. And actually this, what this file contains, with no really big surprise, is our um, configuration. So it says options uh, from, from build, and this is the HTTP port. So if we run it um, without this, we will get, the, um, we'll get it on port 88. I learned a lot of uh, shortcuts for Firefox today because the, my, my trackpad is not that amazing. So, still working? Awesome. So now we have it um, configured in our build SPT. We have another option because, well, some people don't like to use the build SPT that much. So we give you the option to put this uh, application in, in your, like, in your direct, directly in your build. So if we take a look at, uh, well, that could be, so, um, if we, well, I removed this here, and now this application ini is by convention under source universal um, conf application ini. So it automatically gets packaged where this file was created by SPT native packager before. We say, okay, um, create this file. Uh, we created this file for him. So if we, uh, I cleaned it and I stage, then the same file will. Um, appear there as well, and I put like the properties in there. So this is now my, my uh, um, manually generated application in you. So this is nice for the, um, I have to look what comes next, for the customization. And we can still override these um, settings with our system properties we um, give at runtime. So this like the, the ordering is like the type safe config um, so it's, it works like you expect it. Okay, so this is nice. Now you have a stage folder. You could SCP this to your server, but SCPing, well, a big of, lot of files is not that awesome. So you can um, create the, the bare minimum for universal is zip because most of the systems um, use zip, so you can say universal. We are all, all packaging tasks are always scoped, so you really know what you're getting out. So you say package uh, universal, package bin, and in the end um, you will get, so now this command I may copy, you get a, a zip file which is you get a zip file um, Uh, you get a zip file what, when you see uh, the, what is inflated here has exactly the same structure as your staging directory. So it really does nothing special. Um, it just packages up. Um, for a zip file, we had a lot of issues. I should make a side note here. Zipping with the Java library is faster, but on some systems, under some circumstances, the executable flag get lost on your um, bat and bash scripts. And this is unfortunate because you want to run your application. So with no executable flag, um, yeah, the program, the, your server says, no, I can't run it. So this happens mostly on Mac, um, but we haven't figured out yet how to do this. Not even the, the Apache Commons libraries do this correctly, so you have to stick with it. We are really sorry about that, but this is too low level for us to, to really fix. Okay, so this is awesome. and. My build SPT still looks um, the same. The build SPT didn't change. I re-added uh, the Java option settings um, for one reason. The application in if you provide it manually, it's okay. But you can do a lot more stuff in SPT. For example, you can define variables. You can like depend on other settings if you want like the version, you want to give it as a system property, et cetera, et cetera. So you are a lot more flexible and it's still uh, readable and everything gets created as you want. So with these settings, um, 
I can now create a Docker image. That's, it will fail. Um, anybody has Ubuntu 15.04 here? I've, I've since Ubuntu 15.04, I have problems with uh, Docker. I always have to reconfigure it, like adding my user to the, to the Docker group, and then it just works fine again. Okay, so now that I've fixed Docker, um, I can say Docker, and you maybe expect that it's already, again, package bin, but unfortunately, um, it's published local because, well, Docker, you're publishing uh, uh, image to your registry. So now without any changes, we created a Docker image. And uh, you can see the output here. So we um, put in our, uh, our library uh, folder and we put in our bash script. So inside the Docker image just looks like the staging directory. And what I can do now, I can run uh, my Docker command with uh, this, so I have like the, I run it in interactive mode, so we can see the output. Um, I'm doing the port mapping, because well, we have an HTTP service, so I map the port 8088, which is running inside the Docker, to the outside, and it gets published to, this is like the package name, and to the version 1.0. So we run it, and we have a Docker image running. Uh, see the same output as before, and just checking, and service is loading, we can see a uh, console output here, and now it will time out and give probably an internal server error, well, maybe next time. Okay, but the, the image is running uh, smoothly, it uh, can connect to the outside, and this is, this is pretty nice, but well, the, the giving all the, these exposed ports may be a bit well, cumbersome sometimes, so Docker has, um, an exposed ports uh, feature for the Docker file. So we just add this. Um, I'm using here a setting from us. You can see Docker settings, Docker exposed port. And here you see what I mean. When you use the build SPT, you can define variables. So I say, okay, my HTTP port is 8088. And I say inside, um, it should be the same port as on the outside. Uh, it should be the same port on the inside running and the Docker port I expose. So I don't have to define these twice and uh, create probably error-prone um, build SPT files. So now I can publish the, the image again. And we will, s and we will see um, the output for, for this. Um, because we create a, a Docker file, you can see a new line here uh, gets added expose port 88. And now uh, familiar, who is familiar with Docker, you can now um, run the docker command with the capital P, and docker will choose like a, a random port from the outside. You can, can check these with um, docker ps, for example. Okay, it chooses here these port 49,115, uh, 49, and I can, can query this port. So for the docker plugin, um, we exposed the most common settings you may want to uh, use in Docker as uh, SPT settings like expose ports, expose volumes, uh, the, uh, the image you want to use. Um, and if you're not satisfied with this or if Docker changes anything. So with every major, well, like with every Docker release, uh, something broke. Um, because Docker, well, they are not that mature at this point in my experience because like something always didn't work out. Um, you have uh, Docker command settings, and there you have just the list of Docker settings. And you can, if you want to, you can create these settings on your own, and you create your Docker image uh, just as you would, but with your own settings. Um, but this is only for hardcore if you're not happy with what is already provided. So, and this is actually everything about Docker. Um, so we stop that image again so we don't get any problems. So a lot of people like, yeah, using large scale applications, awesome, we want to distribute to the cloud and using uh, huge clusters. But uh, sometimes, or a lot of times, you program a small play application for like 10 of your colleagues and nobody will notice if it's down for half an hour, you just want to restart the server and then everything works just ex expected. So, and for this use case, uh, we have the Java server application type. 
This is actually the, the contribution where I came into uh, SPT Native Packager because Play, at, I think it was version 2, they had a nice plugin that created all the system star scripts like system v script and registered everything and just started the application. And with uh, 2.3, they moved to SPT Native Packager and I couldn't use it anymore. So I ported this um, feature to SPT Native Packager and now I'm one of the core maintainers. So this is how you get stuck into open source uh, really quick. And so we configured this, and as you would expect, this is an auto plugin you can add. So the, build, uh, the packaging configuration just looks the same, but our um, build SPT has now a Java server app packaging, and I'm using JDAP packaging. And I mentioned in our goals we want to build a native platform. But there's an awesome Maven library, JDAP, um, who's doing a really great job packaging um, Debian packages. And it, it figured out some of the problems with permissions, which we dealt um, manually, like setting permissions with command line, chmod, and which was really hairy and really slow. And JDAP is 100 times faster. Um, well, at least it feels like 100 times faster. And we also switched to Java 7 because of JDEP to use like POSIX uh, permissions. And it was before the, uh, Oracle announced end of life and we really got one or two complaints from the community. Why wow, you can't use Java 7, we still stuck with Java 6. But it's, it's your build pipeline, right? When your Jenkins runs on Java 7, it's not that kind of mission critical. I, I hope at least yeah, if you're down for a minute or two or for restarting. So we had one or two complaints, but now as Java 7 end of life uh, is, uh, was announced, um, we will probably soon move to Java 8 if nothing is, uh, speaks against this. So, and JDEP does a really good job. It packages everything. It's, I think we removed the experimental flag from it um, because you can just put it in and now instead of what, like executing the command line with a Debian package, it just executes like this Maven plugin and it works a lot faster. So this is all about the configuration, still one line. And packaging SPT didn't change. And now we build a Debian package. So we say Debian and um, package a binary. So what does uh, this server archetype um, actually do? Well, first of all, it creates some of the um, post install hooks and um, pre install hooks, et cetera, et cetera, like to register everything accordingly and which system loader uh, gets used. Well, this is for, for Ubuntu and Debian. We use Upstart because this is the current um, default in Ubuntu. So, like an Upstart configuration gets generated, you see it here uh, conf file etc init archive microservice.conf. And now you can just run it with dpk, oh, we should do it as sudo, and install in target, and we have like the saving package, and we can install it. So now we expect uh, to start the server and run everything. Well, there's an error. That's intended. I, while I was pre uh, preparing this presentation, I upgraded my Ubuntu from 40.10 to 15.04, uh, and Ubuntu changed the standard um, up to standard system loader from Upstart to systemd. Um, I heard of it that they announced this, but they did this with uh, this release. So this doesn't work because he's trying to register an Upstart. They said I can't find it. Well, it's in German, but it's just say I can't connect to this Upstart daemon. It's not there. And well, what what should we do? Well, half a year ago, a nice contributor. Um, implemented systemd support on Fedora and tested it. I was say, okay, let's try it out or I roll back my system for this presentation. So um, the next step, well, first of all, we, we should deinstall this, uh, this, this package because, well, it's, um, well, it's not of any use. So we deinstall it and, well, it complains here, it tr tries to stop it, but it says HTTP service wasn't even running. Well, yeah wasn't running because it couldn't be started because Upstart is gone. And, but I really like the decision of Ubuntu because Upstart is really a big improvement of our system. We, we had like the most issues in SPT native packager with the system, D, system V Upstart scripts because you have different startup scripts for our preM based systems and for Debian based systems because they have 
different kind of utility methods to start a daemon, and they have different kind of ways to dealing with pits. Especially upper M based systems have uh, very opinionated on who should manage the pit and who shouldn't. So this is really hairy, and Upsort does a lot, uh, does a great job on, on doing this on its own. The, the config script is not like this kind of bash, but it's like this kind of config. And system D has like an even smaller config, and the utility methods are awesome. And I'm not that, that of an ops guy, but as a, dev, as a developer, it's, it's really amazing. So what, what do we have to change? Now we go to the packaging. Um, these two lines. First, we have to import our like, server loader. And this is an enum, which has system V, system D, and upstart. And now we say, OK, our server loading in Debian um, should be system D. For RPM, the default is system V, um, because, well, this system runs on mostly everything, and RPM is like kind of a different beast. And most people in our community, at least what I experienced uh, using um, system, uh, using uh, Debian packaged based systems, and we have really less uh, RPM based users. So let's, let's um, build this again and hope that it works. So again, build a Debian package. And well, this. If you think this takes long, then you have to look at the, how, how long it took with native, pack, uh, with native Debian packaging. It's really incredible. So now we have this user lib system D configuration. And we install our Debian package again. So and now everything seems fine. And now the cool thing is, well, if you do service, aka, let's see, I should have this in my history. Oh, services everywhere. Yeah, this is maybe not the, the right one to search for. Um, so yeah, just type it. So service aka HTTP microservice, and then you have like the status command. On upstart, this says, hey, there's a service running with this pit. Uh, and what, what does uh, systemd actually does? It says, yeah, it's this pit. It has been started with this kind of command, and these are the last logging outputs. Uh, of this uh, application. So we can see it's running on port 88. So we can now ensure that it's really uh, running there on our local system. And it's loading. And we can, of course, look at the logs here. You see the one logging line got added. And just, oh, just forgot about the port. And the service is running again. So I blame the, the, the Wi-Fi connection for this. Um, and as easy as this, we can stop the service. Then we will get, uh, like here, it already said, it's stopped, stopped loading. And we can s start it again. And then we're trying to, to reach the Google DNS server for this. Exactly, it's back up. So this is pretty, pretty amazing. Because you can like really develop fast, small applications and deploy them anywhere. If you restart your machine, they will be up. Uh, your configuration is in a central place. This is really nice to have. So um, I still got time to show you one last feature, and we'll we'll quit with the with the um, microservice here, and I will show you a pretty awesome awesome feature um, that a community member implemented a few months ago. Um, because Oracle uh, joined the native packaging party. They provide with Java 8, they provide a Java app packaging um, script. Um, I think it's Ant based. So if you're using Ant, you, I think you can use it directly. So go ahead if you're using Ant. But I, I, I haven't met anyone besides NetBean users using really Ant. Um, so you can you get a shell script with it, or you can, as uh, our committer did, he created the, like, the ant build file and set up everything and then executed like the ant jar for it. But what this does, well, Oracle, they're really trying to promote, uh, at least at what it's looked like, uh, their JavaFX applications. The, so they provide this packager, which packages you um, your application in a very user-friendly way. So you get like you can specify icons, you can specify how it uh, should feel like and look like. You can package your JRE with your bundle, so you have really a standalone application with your JRE inside, and you can ship it to to clients if you want to. So the build SPT for this is a bit longer. Um, first, uh, um, in the beginning, well, this is 
you have to define a main class which should be run. Um, you enable the JDK Packager plugin, then you do some well, courtesy stuff. And this is like if you um, insert uh, icons for your, for your application, that is a very convenient way to do. This contribution is uh, rather young, so you have to do a bit more configuration if you want to get awesome stuff out. And then you define like a Java uh, JDK app icon. And this is the important part. Uh, this is a default, but I explicitly um, printed it out there. Uh, the JDK packager, um, it does, how it does packaging, it looks on what system you're running, and then it grabs all your build tools you have and try to produce the output package. So if you're on Windows and you have Wixi tools, and I think the other one is called Edem Potent or something like that, this, then it will grab them and create MSI packages, and on Mac it will create DMB, DMG packages and app packages you can put in the App Store, and on Linux, well, RPM and Debian packages. So they also have like uh, support native platform first approach. Um, and this is an important part. Uh, when I upgraded my Ubuntu, uh, I didn't, the, the, well, we have a very sophisticated uh, way of finding this, uh, this Java, this aunt Java FX jar, but uh, if this doesn't work, well, you have to define it explicitly. This, it's still experimental, but it works pretty awesome. So let's, let's check this out. Um, jump to the SBT native package examples. Um, I have a, I, I'm a big fan of copy and paste coding sometimes, and so I have a great, uh, no, a huge uh, example repository um, of SBT native package uh, examples where you can just copy and paste like small snippets. So this is like renaming uh, one file in your, uh, in your build, in your mappings, or this I want to add some Linux sim links. So you can just go there, watch the example, how to do it, and copy them out. And there's a JDK. That's a JDK packager example as well. You can start this, and um, you start this like every other, every other packaging. It's a JDK packager, package, well, first do a clean save. JDK packager, and package bin. So now we'll start creating. Um, this will create a Debian package and an RPM package. It takes a bit longer, so I'm assuming they're using the local native Debian package client. And well, you see it takes a lot longer. And it, by default, it packages a complete JRE with it. So this even takes a bit longer. And uh, while it's packaging that, I have to tell a, a small story about um, of one of our first users using this and they are building a swing client, and it seems that they're building the swing client with uh, SBT, and it was pretty interesting, like, choice of technologies going together, but uh, he seemed pretty happy about uh, SBT native packager, but we had one issue, we didn't support, like, white spaces in your path, so in your execution path, and it was like, well, who, ha who has white spaces on your server? Normally, you, you don't do that, but he, yeah, we're shipping it, our Swing client to our clients, and if they put, they install it in, in a path where white spaces, it doesn't work. So now you can, the bash scratch script also works uh, with white spaces. So if you have, like, crazy, crazy directory stuff doing, then, then it already, uh, always works. So RPM is a lot faster. Um, uh, Mac users, uh, RPM is, is really dangerous for you. Uh, where the most issues with RPM are with Mac OS because of some version constraints or those magic um, predefined something stuff doesn't really work. So um, RPM is some kind of really, really tricky. Uh, um, Debian is a, a lot easier to use. So now it's, it's, um, it's done. So we jump there as well. And we can install, it's not here under JDK Packager. Um, the Debian plugin is unfortunately a bit of a like exception there. Normally the target workspace where everything is built is like the name of the plugin. So JDK Packager, RPM, Docker, you'll find this stuff. And now it's under bundles and we have a Debian package. So we install this and it will create some, some nice uh, links and shortcuts. We, we well, like the SBT native packager doesn't support. So if I search now for, uh, I think it's Scala, or is it JDK? My machine's getting slower and slower every day. Well, 
when it's uh, uh, finished, then you see a, uh, a small icon like that's get added automatically. So this is really, if you do user and client facing applications, um, it's a nice, a nice thing to use the, the JDK packager plugin. I think, oh, I think it's, it's trying to reach the internet at some point. That's really uh, annoying about Ubuntu when they started adding these Amazon and stuff lenses. So, now I'm finished with my demos. Um, we took a look at like how you, you start testing your output package with stage and how you can easily zip it to, to ship it across like every uh, distribution. And then we took a, like a small look on how you can deploy easily a small server with um, the Java server archetype. And uh, well, the last JDK package or plugin is really, really nice, nice addition because it's not really like a competitor, but uh, an, an awesome addition for like completely different use case for the SPT native packager. So, um, what, what are we doing, planning to do? Well, actually we do a lot of boring parts because bug fixing, because we support a lot of output packages um, and things change. Um, we have to like keep up to date. Like I showed you today, um, Ubuntu will change from upstart to systemd and to keep uh, a good user experience we will have to change this default at an appropriate time as well because well in two years or three years when the next uh, LTS version is out well no, it must, must be one year and they change to systemd um, then we should uh, provide this as a default as well and there are always there are a lot of bug fixes in like the bash scripts there are some corner cases uh, you, you didn't thought about and we have a really great great community um, doing a lot of stuff there and Rocket, uh, we had already requests uh, to implement this, and we had a small uh, uh, contributor who already tried. Uh, unfortunately, he hit a Scala uh, compiler bug, which got fixed, uh, fixed I think, in 2.11.5, and we upgraded. Um, but since then, he's been idling, so it could be happen or, or not, um, depending on how fast he will be. Windows services are like on the wish list since I joined two years ago. We had a nice, I think, Polish contributor. Uh, well, we, we wrote every like three months and he did something and it looked promising, but he never did a pull request. It was always like, ah, I, I maybe try to do this and then I do this. So there is code actually there. Uh, I, did, I just took his code and provide the pull request so it doesn't get lost if something happens, but it's like way outdated and well, it's in some state, but there hasn't been any requests for Windows servers until now, so we're delaying this until somebody says, I really, really need this, because as we're an open source project, we are highly demand driven and not what we are, uh, want to do. Documentation is always, it can always be improved because we support a really wide range of targeting systems, build systems, and this means you have a lot of stuff you have to know about. Like um, one guy asked if there's not a step-by-step -step guide to install um, a Debian a play application on a Debian server. And I said, yeah, which Debian server? Do you have Debian Wheezy, maybe with crazy old bash? Or do you have an Ubuntu server? Or what are you using, Upstart, System D, System V? So you can't even easily answer the, the most simple questions because you're depending on really a lot of different kind of uh, environments and settings. So writing like a definitive guide is really hard to do. And um, so we really did a major refactoring of the documentation uh, last year, which improved stuff a lot, um, but it's still hard to find the stuff you need in the documentation sometimes and really try to improve that and a lot of uh, community members do a great job um, improving the documentation. I'm really surprised how many people just add documentation when they solve the problem. You help them on Stack Overflow or a Jitter or something and you ask them kindly and then you get the documentation. So we're really proud of this community and this is what I want to end my talk with because um, it's, it's really been, I, I've been working on open source uh, like since I started programming actually. Um, I, I worked in the Eclipse community a bit and was pretty nice. But this community um, is, is, really, is really awesome because they're not like, hey, it's, it doesn't work. They are, okay, I wanted to do this and I tried this and I expected this but I got this and this is like 
the basic uh, set you really want to work with. And then if you help them to fix the error, um, it, it's most, the most thing you have to do is like, uh, would you like to fix it in SPT with a pull request? Oh, sure. And then two days later, you get a pull request with uh, test coverage, documentation, and um, the fix. So it's, it's really awesome. Um, I'm really surprised we have, we have people, that two people are dedicated to Windows who are fixing the bad scripts. That's really, really amazing. I don't want to touch these bad scripts. It's, it's horrible to read. Yeah? But there are two people who are doing this, and I'm, I'm really thankful for, for this. And yeah, I also have to thank Josh Suret, who was always mentoring. I mean, he was initially one of his projects, and well, more or less I took over. And um, he's really a really great guy uh, helping the, the community. So you can find us on GitHub, and ready for questions. That's what I want to see. No, oh, <laughs> everything works. Yeah. Uh, so I know in the past there was a problem with the JDEC packages being played because of some things. Um, do you think that will be the two Yeah, that's fixed with 2.4. That was uh, really unfortunate because um, we switched to auto plugins with 1.0 and play like gradually migrated to um, auto plugins. And if you mix auto plugins and like the hard coded settings in a build SPT, it's get messy because well, sometimes the auto plugin gets applied before, maybe. Uh, it depends on what it depends. And then other settings override these settings, maybe again, or the other way around. So it was really, really uh, hard. Um, the, the Windows users actually recognized this because uh, the data packaging didn't work. And so Windows tried to use a local Debian package, which didn't work. So, but this is fixed with Play 2.4 as they completely migrated to auto plugins, yeah. Oh, so many happy users. That's awesome. Yeah? Yeah, we we have had this. Uh, we're still having this discussion uh, in the um, place. Uh, to repeat the question, um, like we symlink from uh, default folders on Linux, like etc uh, default or like etc application name, um, to user share bin where everything gets installed. And uh, the the point is that the Debian uh, rec the recommendation from Debian is to actually place these file on this uh, this particular location and not symlink somewhere else. Um, the reason why we do this, um, like we have this packaging out output format, and like we want to keep this packaging output format without copying everything around, like on different formats, but providing the like the best, uh, best practice stuff um, pointing to the complete package. Um, but maybe we'll change it in the future if there's like uh, enough people saying, no, this, this doesn't work because of this or this reason, uh, then we may change it. Uh, uh, this is possible, um, but currently, well, it's, it's just a matter of style because it works. Um, and there wasn't really any like reason for it when it doesn't work yet. But if there's a, a concrete reason, we will change it. Yeah. Cool. Then enjoy the community party. <laughs>